are coming on the air tonight with Israel saying Hamas has lost control of Gaza and the main hospital there is unable to function. Now newborn babies are dying and dozens more are at risk. The World Health Organization says the hospital is now almost a cemetery. We're live in the region for you. Plus, justices trying to boost public confidence in the Supreme Court by adopting a formal code of conduct. We'll get a gut check on how much of a difference this could actually make after revelations of undisclosed trips and gifts to some justices. And the city of San Francisco getting a big makeover ahead of a meeting between President Biden and Chinese President Xi Jinping this Wednesday. Why the fact that it even needs a makeover at all is causing some bad press. And then the FCC set to make a huge decision later this week that could potentially help millions of victims of domestic violence. What one survivor is telling our team about how the important, how important this move could be, that's in tonight's original. Plus, how editing your DNA could help you cut down on high cholesterol. You heard that right. We're going to dig into that with our medical experts. Hey, I'm Aaron Gilchrist, in for Hallie tonight, and we begin with the escalating situation in Gaza. Israel late today saying Hamas has lost control of Gaza as the humanitarian crisis there gets worse. The largest hospital losing its ability to function and operating as, quote, nearly a cemetery. That's from the World Health Organization. That's after days without power, without water, without essential supplies there. The fate of hundreds of people inside the hospital hanging in the balance here as fighting outside intensifies. Doctors say several newborn babies are dying because of a lack of resources. And 36 more reportedly still alive, like you're seeing right here, taken out of incubators because there isn't any power and they're now on manual respirators. As we're seeing a military standoff close by, heavy bombardments, explosions with Israeli forces now advancing deeper into Gaza City as more hospitals in addition to Al-Shifa are on the brink of total collapse. And the United States, just in the last couple of hours here, saying Hamas should do more to protect the people in these hospitals. Listen. If Hamas truly cared for the people in Al-Shifa and in other hospitals in the north, it could take the fuel that it's using to protect its fighters and, diver and send it to the hospitals so the hospitals could protect patients. They are not doing that. All of this as the death toll appears to be growing. The Palestinian Health Ministry saying more than 11,000 people have been killed in Gaza. Kier Simmons is on the ground for us in Tel Aviv tonight. Uh, Kier, we're hearing President Biden say that hospitals in Gaza must be protected. We heard that today. What more do we know about the military action that's yeah. happening right now and these hospitals that are caught in the crossfire? Well, there are a number of hosp hospitals in northern Gaza that are surrounded uh, by the Israeli Defense Force, uh, and they are in very desperate straits. They are seeing fighting outside. From the doctors we talk to, they are frightened to go out uh, because of the clear uh, dangers there. Uh, we've seen explosions uh, outside of hospitals. The Al-Shifa Hospital, for example, which is the biggest in the Gaza Strip. Uh, explosions there in the past few days. And I think that's why you're hearing President Biden uh, make those comments to say we do need to protect uh, the hospitals. We also heard from the European uh, Union, too, uh, urging almost pleading with Israel to uh, show uh, restraint. And then inside, uh, the reports of uh, medical procedures being able to, having to be carried out with cell phone lights. Uh, you, you mentioned the, those uh, uh, babies uh, that were in incubators. We have video of them in the incubators now outside those incubators because there isn't the power uh, to uh, supply the, those incubators. So, so a very, very difficult um, situation for many of these these hospitals uh, hospitals that the israelis say are being used by hamas uh, to uh, protect its forces and place headquarters underneath the hospitals and those kinds of allegations allegations that are denied uh, by uh, doctors uh, but uh, that back and forth doesn't really take us away from the fact that there are uh, civilians in those hospitals who are suffering uh, Kier, I want to ask you, too, about this video. The IDF put out a video today that, and said that uh, it found evidence Hamas was hiding hostages in another hospital there in Gaza. NBC News obviously has not independently verified that video that was provided by the Israeli Defense Force. But what more do you know? What, what else is the IDF saying about this? 
Well, we haven't the ability to verify the video, but it is um, somewhere in the region of six minutes long. Um, it's, a, it's one of the spokespeople for the Israeli Defense Force, for the Israeli Ministry of Defense, and he takes you through. Now, the, the video is roughly edited, so um, it, again, it makes it difficult to ascertain exactly, uh, if you want to call it the authenticity of it. I mean, we would want to be there ourselves, to be sure. Uh, but in the video, uh, the spokesman uh, claims that he is pointing to um, to Hamas tunnels uh, that run down near to one of the hospitals. You then see him in the basement, uh, and he says that this is where um, Hamas has been based. You then see a chair and a rope and various other things, uh, weapons and things, and, and he suggests that that's where uh, hostages have been uh, held. Again, it's not a forensic examination. It's a video uh, produced by the Israelis, and it's impossible for us to kind of uh, litigate the truth of each piece of it. Uh, but that is, again, a part of uh, the allegation being made by the Israelis. And I think you'll see more of this as this uh, conflict develops and uh, as we, if the Israelis, as we, we suspect they will, for example, reach Al-Shifa Hospital, they will try to do the same if, if, if that is possible, if there is the evidence there. All right. Our chief international correspondent, Keir Simmons, for us in Tel Aviv tonight. Keir, thank you. Now, we are just learning about four new attacks on U.S. military bases in Syria since U.S. forces struck facilities used by militants in that country over the weekend. The U.S. says the Iran-backed militants are responsible for the approximately 52 attacks on U.S. military facilities in Iraq and Syria in less than a month's time. And this says we're learning more about five American soldiers killed in a training exercise in the Mediterranean Sea. Let's bring in Courtney Cuby now from her post at the Pentagon. So, Courtney, what more do we know about these new strikes we've mentioned here and, and, and how this sort of fits into the rising concern that the war in Gaza is going to escalate and potentially spread? Yeah, so the, one of the major reasons that the U.S. carried out this now third round of strikes in Syria is to prevent just that, Aaron, to prevent the war from spreading outside of the boundaries of Israel and Gaza into the wider region. Now, this third uh, round of, of airstrikes last night in northeastern Syria, the, the, well, the difference between this one and the previous two, which targeted ammunitions and weapons facilities, this one targeted locations where there may have been Iranian-backed militia members present. Uh, one was a training site, the other was a safe house. Now, Pentagon officials are saying that they do believe there may have been militia members present at the, at the time of these strikes late last night, but they aren't saying anything about any specific numbers of casualties that may have uh, happened during the strikes. Now, I will say the U.S. generally carries out these sorts of strikes in the middle of the night with the goal of trying to minimize any people who might be present at the time. But just the nature of these, these locations, the safe zone and the training facility, would mean that there could have been people present. That's the big difference here. But as you mentioned, we're now over at least 52 attacks on U.S. bases in Iraq and Syria since October 17th. Four of those have occurred since the strike last night, strikes last night. So that really begs the question, Aaron, is the deterrent effect actually working here? Yeah, that's a question a lot of people are asking. Courtney, I do want to ask you, too, about the uh, this helicopter accident. Uh, what details are we getting about the service members, the five soldiers who were killed in this incident uh, on Friday? Well, the, the Pentagon and the military were pretty slow to put out information, and that's because of the unit that was involved here. They're called the Night Stalkers, or the 160th. It's a special operations air unit, and it's a pretty small community, Aaron. That's why the military has been quiet about the specific details. They wanted to ensure that the next of kin, the family members, were notified by them, and they didn't find out about their loved ones being uh, dying in the news. Now, they were part of a what is being called a routine refueling training mission. But it's important to point out that a number of these elite special operations forces, like these night, so night stalkers, have been sent forward to Cyprus and sent forward to the region so that they can be ready if, in fact, there is the need for a civilian evacuation or even a hostage rescue situation in Israel or in the region. They wanted to have them forward deployed so that they would be ready to go. Again, that's not what they were doing at the time of this accident in the eastern Mediterranean. But that's the reason that they, they've been sent forward and, and forward deployed now, Aaron. All right, Courtney Cuby with us tonight from the Pentagon. Courtney, thank you. Thanks. Well, tens of thousands of people expected to march on Washington tomorrow, this time a show of solidarity with Israel, five weeks after the deadly attacks by Hamas. 
The march is being organized by Jewish federations of North America. In addition to showing support for Israel, the group is marching to condemn the rising trend of anti-Semitic violence and to demand that every hostage be immediately released. The march comes as a Biden administration official tells NBC News there is a possibility for a deal for a hostage exchange. It would involve the release of about 80 women and children held by Hamas in exchange for Palestinian women and teens held by Israel. Nine Americans still are missing after the October 7th attack by Hamas. The Supreme Court today announcing it is formally adopting a code of conduct. That's after allegations of ethical lapses raised questions about whether justices were following the rules. The court saying most of the rules and principles outlined today are not new, but that they, the, the lack of a formal code has recently led to, quote, the misunderstanding that the justices of this court, unlike other jurists in this country, regard themselves as unrestricted by any ethics rules. Lawrence Hurley covers the Supreme Court for us and joins us now to help us understand what's happening here. So, Lawrence, we mentioned that the court says these are not new rules that they're following, but this is still something that we all sort of have to wrap our heads around. What what stands out to you? What is new there? And, and, and have any of the rules been broken? Yeah, I mean, in the past, the justices didn't have their own sort of code of conduct, which is something that lower court judges have to follow. And they said that they kind of followed those same rules, mm -hmm. but they couldn't follow them exactly the same as how lower courts follow them, partly because of the differences between the Supreme Court, where you know, there's only nine justices, and if one of them steps down from a case, it can create problems, and they can't be replaced. Right. So things like that, like, they've said today for the first time, okay, this is how we're going to deal with that. These are the rules that we're going to follow. The question of whether they've violated these rules uh, is a very uh, subjective one. But like all these things about the judiciary, which is about appearance of propri impropriety or integrity of the court and these types of things. And, you know, it remains to be seen, you know, how whether people are going to continue to complain that they haven't followed these rules. So what about the oversight piece of this? Right? I mean, what, how uh, will this code be enforced on a court of, of justices who sort of, like we said, have their own rules and are lifetime appointees, so nobody's going to replace them if, if a rule is broken, per se. Yeah, I mean, basically, on, on this issue, they are the judges of their own conduct. Mm -hmm. uh, there is no enforcement mechanism, and that's one of the criticisms that has immediately come out as a result of this announcement, with uh, Democrats on the Senate Judiciary Committee, including Sheldon Whitehouse, saying, you know, that there needs to be an enforcement mechanism because we can't trust, as he would put it, the justices to be the, their own judges. And so um, we're good, it remains to be seen, you know, uh, whether this quells any of the, the criticism of the court. But so far, based on the reactions today, it's not going to. Yeah, we know you'll be keeping an eye on it to see what happens next in this, since it hasn't really quieted some of the complaints. Lawrence Hurley, we appreciate it. Thank you. No worries. Thanks. Well, right now, House Republicans taking a big step to move forward with Speaker Mike Johnson's last minute plan to keep the government open. There's a Friday night deadline that could lead to a near total shutdown. If the Rules Committee gives the OK, all eyes turn to tomorrow for a floor vote that, if passed, will send the bill to the Senate. The plan would take a so-called two-step approach that would extend funding for areas like agriculture, transportation, veterans affairs. That would go until mid-January. The rest of the bills, including defense spending, would get a longer extension through the beginning of February. Now, this whole plan, not hugely different than what former Speaker Kevin McCarthy used to keep the government open back in September, which, of course, led to McCarthy's ouster at the hands of his own members and kicking off weeks of speakerless chaos. NBC's Ryan Nobles following this for us and joins us now from the Hill. So, Ryan, some House Republicans on the far right are not going to vote for anything that includes spending cuts or doesn't include spending cuts, I should say. How much trouble does, does this put the speaker in at this point? Well, Aaron, he's got to pick his poison, right? Uh, if he passes something with deep spending cuts that wins over the support of conservative Republicans, then he stands to lose Democrats in the Senate. And it's certainly something that President Biden won't sign into law. So what Speaker Johnson is looking for right now is a sweet spot. He essentially has to concede that he's going to lose a fair number of conservative Republicans who have said many times that they would never vote for any sort of short-term spending plan, much less one that doesn't include any sort of spending cuts. And then bring 
bring along just enough Democrats that it doesn't alienate some of those conservatives where it then puts his speakership in jeopardy. And that's what he's hoping plays out here over the next couple of days to at least offer him a little bit of breathing room so that they can have longer term discussions about a much longer term spending plan and one that might include things like some of those spending cuts that he's talking about or even perhaps policy proposals and funding uh, for border security as well. Aaron. So, so, Ryan, that's in the House, right? We know that Senate Democrats are also planning their own bill here, a one-step process to sort of keep the status quo going. Mm -hmm. How do we think this is likely to play out here? Who, who's going to uh, uh, sort of win this, this game of chicken that we're seeing between the two chambers? Yeah, you know, Aaron, I think that what many politicians up here have realized, in fact, the vast majority of politicians of up here have realized is that no one wins if the government shuts down. So what they're trying to fashion here is some sort of an agreement where everyone can maybe not necessarily love it, but like it enough just to get it over the finish line. And, and you do get the sense that Democrats, both in the House and Senate Democrats, aren't in love with this laddered approach that Speaker Johnson has proposed, but because it doesn't include any spending cuts and because it does a provide, provide them more time to negotiate a longer term bill, it's something that they're willing to accept to avoid the government being shut down. Now, the Senate is going to begin the process of passing their own, what we, they might call a clean short term spending bill tonight, but that's only a, a kind of break glass in case of emergency if they feel as though the House runs into roadblocks. And those roadblocks could come as soon as tonight because the first procedural step on this piece of legislation uh, will happen in a vote sometime late tonight through the House Rules Committee. If it gets through the Rules Committee, there's a good chance it'll pass the House and then move on to the Senate. If it fails in the Rules Committee, that's when we're going to have to seriously start having a conversation about whether or not the government will shut down as soon as this Friday. Aaron. All right. I think I remember reading in a textbook somewhere something about compromise and making laws and, and that sort of thing. <laughs> It'll be interesting to, to see how. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan Nobles for us on the Hill. Thank you, Ryan. Well, questions tonight about the moment a Secret Service agent assigned to protect President Biden's granddaughter opened fire last night. Officials say the agents saw possibly three people breaking the window of a parked Secret Service vehicle. That's when one of the agents fired his gun. No one was hurt. Now, the situation went down in the Georgetown neighborhood here in D.C. Uh, near Naomi Biden Neal's house. This comes as we are seeing carjackings on the rise here in D.C. in the last few years. This year in particular, police have reported more than 850 of them this year. Ali Rafa joins us now with the latest on this. So, Ali, we know that there was no threat to the to the agents, uh, to the people that the agents were protecting here. But uh, still, this agent fired a weapon. What more can you tell us? What do you know about what happened? Yeah, Aaron. So uh, a source familiar with this uh, incident tells us that they don't believe that this incident took place out of any direct uh, attack or our intent to attack Naomi Biden, one of uh, President Biden's four granddaughters, because of her close personal connection to the president. Uh, and they say that, as a matter of fact, they don't even believe Naomi Biden knew that this was going on outside of her home in the Georgetown area of Washington, D.C., when this took place a little bit before midnight. Uh, Secret Service says that those offenders immediately fled the scene once uh, one of those agents uh, released and discharged their service weapon. They don't believe that they were hurt, and a regional bolo or a be on the lookout order was issued to surrounding units in the area. Uh, and right now, D.C. Metro Police and Secret Service are working together to investigate this incident as those three people still remain at large, Aaron. So, Ali, you know, you and I were talking about this earlier today. Uh, it's not really an isolated incident in terms of carjackings, right? There's been a rise here in the city of carjackings and car thefts. We remember last month, Congressman Cuellar from Texas was carjacked here in D.C. by three armed people less than a mile away from the Capitol. Uh, this seems to be something that we're seeing more and more of, right? Absolutely. This uptick happening uh, so quickly, and it's so much of an uptick uh, that uh, the D.C. Police Department has actually created a task force to be able to address this. You mentioned Representative Henry Cuellar being carjacked a few weeks ago. We've also seen Congresswoman Angie Craig of Minnesota, uh, who was uh, assaulted inside her apartment building in Washington, D.C. Uh, and D.C. police are reporting that in just the last year, there have been more than 800 carjackings 
carjackings, as well as more than 6,000 reports of stolen vehicles in D.C. Obviously, this becoming a major concern uh, just here locally, but also it's come up uh, on a national platform, on a national level. This came up during the White House press briefing today. Cur press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre was asked uh, whether the president is concerned about the uptick in violence here in Washington, D.C., considering so many lawmakers live in Washington. And she said that, yes, the president is concerned. Uh, take a listen to a bit more of what she had to say. We can't do this alone. The president, again, has taken action. He's, with the American Rescue Plan, billions of dollars were able to go into states, into communities, so that they can they can provide um, funding and police and police officers to make sure that their communities are safe. But we need more. The press secretary calling on Republicans in Congress to do more to improve public safety efforts federally. Aaron. All right, Ali Rafa for us here in Washington. Ali, thank you. Donald Trump Jr. back on the stand today as the defense starts its arguments in the $250 million civil fraud trial against his father and the family business. The former president's son testified about the, quote, incredible things the Trump organization has accomplished over the years. And he praised his father as a visionary for pushing boundaries. This is the second time on the stand for the former president's son, who was already called by prosecutors. Vaughn Hilliard is in New York City for us now, keeping an eye on all of the developments today. So, Vaughn, uh, this is Don Jr.'s second time testifying, as we said. What did we hear from his testimony today for the defense versus what we heard when he was questioned by prosecutors? Right, Aaron. This is the key part here, is that it was his own defense lawyer asking him the question here. This is the second half of this trial that began today. Don Jr. was the first witness called to the stand by the defense lawyers. And unlike when the prosecution was asking Don Jr. questions, and the judge, Engoron, would jump in, and uh, like he did with uh, former President Trump last Monday, urging the defendants to answer the specific questions of the New York Attorney General prosecutor. This go around, uh, the defendant, Don Jr., was allowed to further elaborate and build out his own narrative over the course of more than four hours on the witness stand, specifically around the Trump organization and its history. Don Jr., dating back to the creation of the company by Fred Trump, down to his father, uh, long to the point where he became an executive with the company in the early 2000s, he laid out the different Trump properties from the likes of Chicago to to Hawaii, to Las Vegas, to Scotland, to here in New York, and making the case as to why the Trump Organization is of even greater value than uh, the financial records that he signed his name to, and that the judge in this case has already ruled uh, amounted to financial fraud, uh, is greater than. Uh, this is a complicated case that Don Jr. is uh, trying to move past here as he elaborates as to the extent to which, in fact, the Trump Organization uh, is not given its due credit for the extent to which it actually is valued. You know, I, would, I do want to ask you, Vaughn, from what you've been seeing, what you've been reporting, how does the younger Trump here fit into the larger strategy of what the defense is trying to accomplish? Right. It's important to remember that this is not just the Trump organization that is a defendant here. Don Jr. and Eric, not Ivanka, but Don Jr. and Eric are defendants, as well as the former chief financial uh, officer, uh, Alan Weisselberg, uh, as well as Jeffrey McConney, the, the comptroller for the company. And Don Jr. has uh, repeatedly suggested that he relied on the word of the accountants of the company, those who were in charge of the actual finances. Well, that would responsibility would fall on the likes of Alan Weisselberg and Jeffrey McConney, two of the other defendants here. And this is where this case gets uh, tricky. Don Jr. did, in fact, sign these financial records. At the same time, he said that he relied on the words and the minutia to be understood and put together by the finance team here. And so this is where the judge has already ruled on the financial fraud uh, claims and one claim, but there are six other claims that he is now mulling over on how to rule. And Don Jr. is hoping that uh, he, the penalty incurred by him and his family uh, are not any uh, uh, additional to what he's already been ruled against on. All right, Vaughn Hilliard for us tonight in New York City. Vaughn, thank you. Still a lot more ground to cover here tonight. Coming up, Iceland declaring a state of emergency over warning signs of a potential volcanic eruption. Why one town's already evacuated, that's in our five things. Plus, a Mississippi man who was killed by police and buried without his family's knowledge exhumed today. 
what his family's calling for now when we come back. Calls getting louder tonight for the Justice Department to investigate the death of a Mississippi man run over by a local police car. His family saying they were kept in the dark for months about his whereabouts while they thought he was only missing. Dexter Wade's family says a federal investigation is needed now more than ever after his body was exhumed from a pauper's field this morning at the request of the family, but hours before they were told it would happen, meaning no one but the public works crews were there to witness this. Dexter's mother voicing her frustration earlier today. Listen. Now y'all have buried my baby. Y'all have took him out the ground. Y'all put him in the ground without my permission. So I don't have no permission. Now we've been covering this story on this program since NBC News reporter John Shupi broke it last month. Dexter Wade was last seen alive by his mother in March as he walked out of the home they shared. He was killed minutes after that as he tried to cross a nearby freeway on foot. Dexter's mother, though, would spend the next 172 days totally in the dark until police realized they had made, they say, a clerical error in not informing the family. NBC's Blaine Alexander is covering the story for us tonight. Uh, Blaine, talk to us a little bit more about what was supposed to happen with Dexter's body today and then what the family actually experienced instead. Well, Aaron, as you can understand, there is a lot of frustration, a lot of anger from that family tonight, and, and many would say rightfully so. So what was supposed to happen, and this is according to uh, my colleague, John Shupi, who, as you mentioned, broke this story. He was actually there in Jackson covering everything that's happened. Everything was set for 1130 in the morning. That was the understanding. But he said that when crowds started to arrive there, everything had already happened. So not only uh, was Dexter Wade's mother caught off guard, but the family members, they even had a minister show up there. All of them were completely blindsided by the fact that the exemption had already taken place. Now, I understand that all that Dexter's mother, uh, Betterstein Wade, was able to actually witness was the transfer of his remains from the basically the back of the coroner's vehicle into the hearse. So you can understand why the family says that trust is even further broken here. Here's what attorney Ben Crump, who represents that family, had to say today. Take a look. Imagine if this was your loved one who they killed and then bear it without your permission, and then exhume them after they told you they were gonna respect you this time. Would you trust anybody in Mississippi now? And so there you have him uh, voicing the frustrations on behalf of the family. And of course, Aaron, they said that they wanted to exhume him to have their own private autopsy and then to have a proper burial and a funeral for him as well. Aaron. Yeah, they, he deserves that for sure, Blaine. I, I do want to ask you, too. I mean, we have uh, obviously Attorney Crump there. You have Dexter's family all saying they want to see the DOJ step in here and look into what happened. What might that look like? And has the Department of Justice indicated that this is something that it would look into? Well, the investigation would come from the Civil Rights Division of the DOJ. That's who they're asking to come in and really just kind of do a thorough review of this entire situation from beginning to end and take a close look at the Jackson Police Department. I've been speaking with uh, a colleague of Ben Crump's today, and he told me that that request has actually formally been made by other people who are affiliated with this case as well. He said that that request has been out there for the past week or so. So now the question is, of course, will the DOJ take this up? How long will that investigation last if it is, in fact, launched? And, of course, what sort of information will will yield. But you can certainly understand why what happened today is further fueling those calls for the DOJ to come in and investigate. That's what we heard from Dexter Wade's mother, his family members, Ben Crump. All of them are saying this is yet another reason why they need some outside eyes to come in. Aaron. All right, Blaine Alexander with us tonight. Blaine, thank you. Appreciate it. Let's get you over to the five things we think you should know about tonight. Number one, a state of emergency in Iceland with officials there saying there is a really good chance of a volcanic eruption soon. Hundreds of earthquakes have been shaking the island for weeks now. One coastal town even evacuated after cracks formed on roads there. Scientists say there is a large magma tunnel forming underground. Number two, Marianne Trump Barry, former President Donald Trump's older sister, has died at the age of 86 in her home in New York. That's according to two sources familiar. She was a retired federal judge. We don't yet know the exact cause of her death. Number three, the man known as the QAnon shaman who stormed the Capitol on January 6th 
just filed paperwork to run for Congress in Arizona. Jacob Chansley served over two years in prison for his role in the attack. Prosecutors called him the, quote, public face of the Capitol riot. He says he wants to run as a libertarian to fill the seat of a Republican who is not running again next year. Number four, Senator Tim Scott dropping out of the 2024 Republican presidential race. He made the announcement on Fox News, surprising several of his own campaign staffers. Scott says he thinks voters, quote, have been really clear that they're telling me not now. Number five, President Biden honoring this year's Stanley Cup champions at the White House in a ceremony today. The Vegas Golden Knights won their first Stanley Cup. That was back in June. It was the first visit by an NHL team since April of 2022 when Tampa Bay Lightning celebrated their back-to-back -back titles won during the pandemic. But when we come back, a state of emergency in Los Angeles after a massive fire shut down a freeway, a traffic nightmare it could cause ahead of a big travel week. Plus, what's turning this pond in Hawaii pink? That's later in the local. One of the country's busiest and most important interstates could become a traffic nightmare. Transportation officials saying this is an all hands on deck situation we're talking about here. Take a look. This highway right here, the I-10 that goes through uh, the heart of Los Angeles, usually seeing some 300,000 cars and trucks every day empty today. A massive fire ripped through storage lots underneath that highway. Now it's closed in both directions for the foreseeable future. This comes as TSA today is saying it is getting ready to see more travelers than ever at airport security this holiday season. That travel surge is getting started this weekend ahead of Thanksgiving. And from this Friday up until November 28th, TSA anticipating screening some 30 million passengers. Liz Kreutz is joining us now from Los Angeles. Uh, Liz, we know the governor there declared a state of emergency because of this highway situation. I know they call it freeway out there in, in California. So uh, two questions for you here, really. What do we know about exactly what happened there and what progress are the crews making today to try to get this freeway back open? Hey, Aaron. Yeah, so right now, investigators are trying to determine the structural safety of this portion of the freeway. In fact, what they're doing is trying to determine if they can simply do repairs or if they need to actually demolish it entirely and then rebuild it. And obviously, that would take longer. They're t currently taking samples from the concrete and the rebar to make that determination. And so this is a really big undertaking. Here's what the mayor of L.A. had to say this morning. This was a huge fire, and the damage will not be fixed in an instant. Losing the stretch of the 10 freeway will take time and money from people's lives and businesses. It's disrupting in every way. And what we know is that this fire started just after midnight Saturday morning in a storage yard. It then quickly overtook this portion of the freeway. It was so hot that it burned and melted some of the guardrails there. And the big question is how exactly the fire itself started. That is still under investigation. There's questions about a nearby homeless encampment. But right now, officials say there's no immediate indication that it began there. All of that's still under investigation, Aaron. We'll look to see what comes out of that. But, you know, this this is happening ahead of a, a big travel time. Obviously, a lot of people are going to be flying, but we know there's another 49 million people expected to be driving over the coming holidays. Uh, the, the, the 10 is closed for more than a mile, right, in the section we put on the screen here for folks to see. But mm -hmm. there could be ripple effects into other key freeways in that area, right? How critical is getting this thing back open? Yeah, it's really critical. You mentioned it before, 300,000 people travel on this portion of the freeway every day, and that's not even during a holiday rush period. Anyone who's traveled through L.A. during Thanksgiving knows what a mess it can be. So if this continues into next week, it's certainly going to cause some major traffic congestion or add to the congestion. Right now, commuters have been told to stay away, to stay home, to work from home if they can. If they can't, they're asked to take public transportation or detours, but that is causing a ripple effect and making some more congestion in other parts of the city. Aaron. And we know L.A. doesn't need any more of that. Liz Croix for us uh, at our Los Angeles Bureau. Liz, thank you. Well, all eyes are on the meeting between President Biden and China's President Xi Jinping set for this Wednesday. The two have no shortage of hard issues to talk through as the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Summit is underway in San Francisco this week. The leaders of the world's two biggest economies are sitting down for their first talks in a year. 
Some of the focus heading into that meeting is squarely on the host city itself. San Francisco struggling to rebound from the pandemic, now inviting in leaders from around the world. So how will they view the city? Jake Ward has that story. San Francisco is already a target of America's conservative media. San Francisco has hit rock bottom and they need an intervention. Now, the arrival of the 21 APEC nations and the backdrop of the high-stakes meeting between two of the world's most powerful men means it is under the spotlight globally. It'll get scrutiny from countries like China, which already judges the place pretty harshly. A city where millions of immigrants once came to chase the American dream is now a place where many are trying to flee from. Chinese tourists have mocked the city's rough reputation on social media, and diplomats used past episodes like 2020's Black Lives Matter protests to depict democracy as a failed experiment. Racial discrimination against minorities is chronic sickness in American society. After the pandemic and remote work emptied San Francisco's downtown, local businesses are eager for this week of Asian Pacific power players. APEC is going to be wonderful for the city. Gil Payumo is ready. It comes in a perfect moment. We need this, you know, drastically. But is the city? San Francisco has been repaving streets and power washing train stations to prepare for 30,000 visitors from 21 nations. The delegates, the press, the CEOs, right. it's going to be pretty, right. pretty amazing. San Francisco's mayor says it's a chance to turn the city's image around. We expect lasting impacts on our city, uh, whether it's the economy, tourism, conventions, and also just really uh, the narrative about San Francisco. Are there any steps that you've tried to take as mayor ahead of APEC to keep a diplomatic core member from, you know, wandering into the wrong part of the city. We are not trying to hide what the problems are of San Francisco. And we hope that people get a chance to experience, of course, great parts of San Francisco, but also know that we have our challenges and they are not as bad as what people are trying to portray them as. It is a beautiful city full of picturesque scenes, but a visitor doesn't have to walk far to encounter some misfortune. The summit cordoned off several blocks of downtown, and people living on the streets in that area have been moved by city crews in recent days. The city will be patrolled by state, federal, and city officers all week. But how San Francisco is portrayed abroad is not up to the mayor. People have their own plans, their own agendas for whatever they decide they want to use San Francisco for. And what I like to do is make sure that people have at least the opportunity to experience it for themselves. With so many visitors in town and world leaders dueling over trade and diplomacy, Apex Summit here could fuel spin about the condition of the West, sure. But for at least some of the delegates, they'll go home with memories of a meal, a sunset, a view from the hilltops. And Jake Ward joins us live now from San Francisco. So, Jake, the mayor said that, that they're not trying to hide the reality of the city, right? But talk a little bit about how concerned the city is in hosting an event like this potentially based on some of the negative media attention that, that the city's gotten. Well, I think people here in the United States, Aaron, have already brought, of course, their perception of San Francisco to uh, media portrayals, uh, you know, up and down the dial. But, uh, you know, Asian nations, uh, you know, some of the most prosperous, most urban countries in the world gathering here, they're going to be bringing an entirely different set of standards. I mean, China alone, right, is a place that does not exa exactly uh, tolerate disorder. And here you're going to have the prospect of, of not just some of the urban challenges we've seen, the break-ins, the smell of marijuana in the air. Um, you're going to have protests out in the open. All of that, of course, is of a concern. But as you heard the mayor say there, she says, we are not trying to hide anything here. We are instead just hoping that people get to experience this city for themselves, Aaron. And you talked about some of the some of the good things, some of the stuff that we can appreciate about the San Francisco Bay Area. And we heard Gil talk there about potentially, you know, the money that will be spent there. So sort of a net positive for the local economy? I mean, it absolutely is in terms of this week and beyond. But the real hope here, Aaron, is the more than 1,000 CEOs who are also gathering for APEC. You've got the CEO of Citigroup and Exxon and hundreds more gathered in this town. This is a city, of course, that made its name and its money off of being the headquarters of so many brand name companies. I have no doubt that it is the hope of the mayor. She said it over and over again uh, that we're hoping that, that the CEOs will see that this is the place to be. Uh, you know, from all the places they could choose from around the world, Aaron. All right, Jake Ward for us in San Francisco tonight. Jake, thanks. 
Well, NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day, and because it's tough to read, watch, or listen to all of them, our regional bureaus have done it for you. This is a segment we call The Local. From our Western Bureau, today marks one year since four University of Idaho students, Kaylee Gonzalez, Madison Mogan, Zana Chernobyl, and Ethan Chapin were stabbed to death in an off-campus house. There are statewide vigils set for tonight. The suspect in this case, Brian Koberger, was arrested last December. He has pleaded not guilty to four counts of murder. A trial date has not been set. From our Southern Bureau, Texas A&M has fired the head football coach, Jimbo Fisher. The move will cost the school 75 million bucks. That's because it owes him what remains of his 10-year deal. Fisher previously led Florida State to a national championship. Texas A&M hoped that he could do the same there, but the team never won a Southeastern Conference division title during his tenure. Also from our Western Bureau, take a look at this. A pond in Hawaii turning bright pink. Looks like Pepto, right? Scientists think that it could be from some type of organism that thrives in salty water. They say the drought there is likely making things worse. They're warning people not to drink it, don't go into the water while they try to figure out exactly what's causing this. Coming up, the FCC set to decide this week on new rules that could help domestic violence victims. We'll explain that for you in our original tonight. Stick around. Well, now we want to bring you tonight's original with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been keeping an eye on. Tonight, we're looking at a critical decision from the Federal Communications Commission set to come down on Wednesday. It would impact millions of American victims and survivors of domestic violence. This is something so common, the National Domestic Violence Hotline says it affects more than 12 million people every year. The new guidelines up for vote would force phone companies to be more responsive and more sensitive to cases of domestic violence because a cell phone could be a lifeline for someone in a violent and dangerous situation. Noah Pransky brings us the story. You know a cell phone as your daily planner or your gaming device or a social outlet. But does someone in an abusive relationship, it's a lifeline. He got so mad and he started choking me and... My son woke up and he was crying, and that did not stop him from keep, come, keep going. Joanne, a domestic violence survivor, remembers that one night particularly well. I eventually uh, managed to, you know, run out the house without shoes, and uh, I run to the neighbor to ask for a phone so I can call the cops because he had took all the phones from me. Joanne has a complicated relationship with phones. She said it was a way for her ex to monitor her. It was a tool of control for years. A lot of people are depending financially from their abusers. Until she finally separated from her family plan and got her own phone. If you've ever tried to change your cell phone number or your cell phone plan, you know how incredibly challenging it can be even without an abusive relationship. But adding domestic violence and it gets exponentially harder. That though is about to change. The Federal Communications Commission is set to vote Wednesday on landmark new guidelines that will force cell phone providers to be more responsive to victims of domestic violence. Part of the Safe Connections Act, the new rules will mask calls to domestic violence hotlines and shelters from cell phone bills, make it easier for victims to separate from their family plans, and provide new low-cost phones for men and women who need to escape a dangerous situation. If you are living through really unthinkable circumstances, and suffering quietly with domestic abuse, it is hard to pick up that phone and call someone. And it's doubly hard if you know that there's going to be a record of it that your abuser will see. Jessica Rosenworcel, the first woman to ever lead the FCC, has been shaping the new regulations with input from advocates, including those of the National Domestic Violence Hotline. Are you safe to talk right now? Which makes 90,000 contacts each month, more than a million each year. And most of those victims reach out via cell phone. You know, I think about when I worked in a local shelter and a woman coming in with her kids. I'm gonna start crying. Wait to be <laughs> A woman coming in to the shelter with her children and the cell phone being the vehicle that she would use to look for a job, to call the local clinic, to be able to communicate with her kid's school. We have to be able to have the ability for her to do that safely and privately to protect not only her life, but her children's life. 
According to the hotline, one in four women and one in seven men will experience physical violence in their lifetime. Rosenworcel wants to try to improve those numbers. When I took over the Federal Communications Commission, this is not the things that I thought I would do, be doing with my day to day, but it's been among the most gratifying work we're doing. And Joanne, now years removed from her bad situation, is glad other victims will have one more tool to build their exit plans. Being able to get your own plan kind of make you feel somehow, I know it might sound weird, but self-sufficient as a person. Noah Pransky is joining us now. Uh, Noah, talk to us about the relationship really between a, a domestic violence victim and a cell phone and, and what this FCC vote could actually do for these some of these victims. Yeah, it seems like a small measure, but it really is a huge deal. A few numbers for perspective here. We have a lot of neighbors who are going through this, and we may never know it. According to the National Domestic Abuse Hotline, um, 24 people per minute in America are victims of rape, violence, or stalking. And another number here, Aaron, 98 percent of abuse rela abusive relationships, according to the hotline, include financial abuse or control as well. And that's why cell phone independence is so important. One other set of really important numbers here, the National Domestic Violence Hotline. If you want to reach them, you can t you can call 1-800-799-7233 or text the word START to 88788. Reaching out for help, Aaron, is the first step toward finding a way out of a bad situation. All right, Noah Pransky for us tonight. Some really important information there. Noah, thank you. Yeah. Still to come, a new way to treat high cholesterol could involve editing your genes. We're breaking down a new study with a doctor. Stay with us. Well, for the first time, new research is showing that gene editing, that's when doctors and scientists use technology to change your DNA, can actually help cut down on high cholesterol. Now, this could impact millions of people in the U.S. who have this genetic condition that causes really high cholesterol. The scientists behind this study say it could eventually be a powerful new way to prevent heart attacks and even strokes. Dr. Kavita Patel is joining us now to help us understand how it all works. So without getting too technical here, <laughs> help us understand how does this work and, and, and uh, uh, you know, how could it be a game changer? Yeah, science is amazing. If you had told me <laughs> in medical school that we would have something that surgically cuts genes down to the letter, if you remember how the genes look with that double helix mm -hmm. and the kind of A's and the D's and the E's, it can literally clip out one of those letters. And that's what we're talking about, a technology called CRISPR. And that that is what scientists looked at to try to tackle a gene that can result in high cholesterol. And so they say, yes, we think we can we can do something about right. this. But it was a pretty small was sample small. size here, right? So how did right. how are they able to draw these sort of conclusions? Yeah. So what they were looking for is kind of proof of concept. Mm -hmm. That's really what having a ten patient panel size does for you in a study like this. It's just is this technically feasible? Does it actually result in clinical outcomes? And then can we track over longer term and short term any effects or things that are bad, safety issues that we would want to flag? So that's why it's ten. But the plans are to expand. And again, it can impact just in the United States alone, millions of people who have this one particular expression of a gene, PCSK9, which actually helps clean out your body of bad cholesterol. So we're actually turning off a gene that helps produce bad cholesterol. You know, I think about the fact that as we're talking, I realize I, I didn't take my allergy pill today. I didn't I, take my vitamin. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Right. I'm but, but the, you know, I think about in this case, there are statins that people take to try to control cholesterol. But we know that people don't always yeah. remember to take the stuff that they're supposed to, to take. This would sort of eliminate human error when it comes to cholesterol. We yeah. hope so. We still have a lot of those long term questions. And then this was just 10 patients. Will we see this in other populations that have this gene expression? But it is a game changer, not just for high cholesterol but all the other diseases we're applying it to, Alzheimer's, cancer. The FDA is going to be reviewing this type of technology, CRISPR, for sickle cell. It will change the lives, potentially, of billions when you think about this technology and then applying it to what you just said. And if it makes you feel better, we're all human. <laughs> I forget to take my medications. I did this morning. Yeah. So I'll go home and do that. Right, we'll both catch up. <laughs> yeah. I, I do have to wonder, though. I mean, we, we talk about the FDA. We look at how right. science happens. Right. It doesn't typically move quickly. No, it doesn't. So when you look at something like this, how far out do you think we are from yeah. being able to apply this in a more practical way 
across all these different uh, issues. That yeah, I, I do think that the next decade is going to be just a renaissance era in genetics, cell therapy, and those we've already gotten, like this study, we've already got the proof of concept. And then in other places, cell therapy and genetic therapies that can help with sickle cell, cystic fibrosis, we've got proof of concept and patients in trials. So we're in a really incredible position, Aaron. This is a little bit like a couple of decades ago when yeah. we started having more treatments for cancer. And today I can tell you an advanced, a patient with advanced lung cancer, I can bring them to survival in five years. I couldn't wow. say that a decade ago. Yeah. Same for this technology. It is amazing. It As is. you say, science. science. Look at it. <laughs> Dr. Yeah. Kavita Patel, we appreciate you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks so much. And that is a wrap for this hour. More coverage picking up right now. We are coming on the air tonight with Israel saying Hamas has lost control of Gaza and the main hospital there is unable to function. Now newborn babies are dying and dozens more are at risk. The World Health Organization saying the hospital is now almost a cemetery. We're live in the region for you. Plus, justices trying to boost public confidence in the Supreme Court by adopting a formal code of conduct. We'll get a gut check on how much of a difference this could actually make after revelations of undisclosed trips and gifts to some justices. And more questions about what exactly happened when a Secret Service agent opened fire during an attempted break-in of a government car near the home of the president's granddaughter. What we know so far. Then growing anger in Mississippi after the body of a man who was hit by a police car was exhumed hours before his family knew anything about it. What they want to see happen next. Plus, officials and commuters in Los Angeles bracing for what could be a tough traffic situation for the foreseeable future. That's after a major highway was shut down because of a fire. What officials are now doing to get that road back open safely. Hi, everybody. I'm Aaron Gilchrist in for Halley. And tonight we begin with the escalating situation in Gaza. Israel late today saying Hamas has lost control of Gaza as the humanitarian crisis there gets worse. The largest hospital losing its ability to function and operating as, quote, nearly a cemetery, the World Health Organization says. That's after days without power, without water, without essential supplies. The fates of the hundreds inside the hospital hanging in the balance now as fighting outside intensifies. Doctors say several newborn babies are dying because of a lack of resources. And 36 more reportedly still alive, like you see in the picture here, taken out of incubators because there isn't any power and they're now on manual respirators. That's as we're seeing a military standoff close by, heavy bombardments, explosions, with Israeli forces now advancing deeper into Gaza City as more hospitals, in addition to al-Shifa, are on the brink of total collapse. And the United States, just in the last couple of hours, saying Hamas should do more to protect the people in these hospitals. Listen. If Hamas truly cared for the people, in Al-Shifa and in other hospitals in the north, it could take the fuel that it's using to protect its fighters and, diver and send it to the hospitals so the hospitals could protect patients. They are not doing that. All of this as the death toll appears to be growing, the Palestinian health ministry saying more than 11,000 people have been killed in Gaza. Kier Simmons is on the ground for us in Tel Aviv now uh, tonight. Kier, uh, we heard the president this afternoon say that Gaza hospitals must be protected. Talk to us about the situation on the ground there in Gaza right now at some of these hospitals. Well, Aaron, we've been talking to doctors through the day in the Al-Shifa hospital, which is the biggest hospital in the Gaza Strip. Uh, the way that they describe things is dire. Uh, you can actually hear when you talk to them at times gunfire and shelling in the background, so you can hear it for yourself. Uh, you can see the pictures because they're managing to get some images out of patients in hallways uh, of them trying to conduct uh, treatment with patients using cell phone lights. Uh, you, you can see for yourself how difficult it is simply from the picture of those newborn babies, those premature babies, which we were there a few weeks ago and, and we saw them in their incubators and now the photos of them not in incubators and the why, reason why they're not, according to the doctors at Al Shifa, is because there is no power to run those incubators. So they're just trying to keep those babies warm by wrapping them up uh, and looking after them as best they can, but at the same time not really being able to use the equipment they actually have in the hospital. It just tells you everything uh, that you need uh, to know about that. And then when they look outside of the hospital, bodies piling up. There was an attempt 
to evacuate one hospital today, according to the Palestinian Red Crescent. It wasn't possible because of the shelling and the gunfire. And then, of course, as you watch those pictures of the Israeli ground invasion in uh, Gaza, you also think about those uh, Israeli hostages who are still held there, those 239. Some of them, well, one, for example, a 10-year-old baby. So children on both sides with the clock ticking for their survival, honestly. Kira, I want to ask you about these calls for a ceasefire that we know are growing still tonight. We heard the Indonesian president today at the White House say that uh, he wanted the U.S. to push more for a ceasefire there. Can you talk a little bit about why that still doesn't look like it's something that's going to happen? Well, there's the humanitarian side, isn't there? And then there's the, the military and the strategic side. And the reality is that this is a war between Israel and Hamas. And certainly Israel is determined to pursue it until they at least wipe out Hamas's capabilities, uh, if not Hamas itself. And that's what Prime Minister Netanyahu has talked about. And then, of course, we can see Hamas fighting back. Uh, so that in that context, with the two sides fighting each other, it's difficult to see the possibility of a ceasefire. And Prime Minister Netanyahu has made clear he's not interested in a ceasefire at this stage. I mean, clearly there is you know, a growing concern around the world. You have the European Union to, uh, talking about urging uh, Israel to show re restraint, as well as, at the same time, criticizing Hamas in that same statement. So uh, there, there is, I think, you know, traditionally there would be a point where the international community, uh, the, the, the calls from the international community would get so loud that Israel, particularly from the U.S., that Israel would stop. Um, but because of what happened on October 7th, I think one of the big questions here is whether the whole thing has changed whether it is possible for the international community in the U.S. to have that kind of leverage with, with Israel in the end. All right, our chief international correspondent, Keir Simmons, live for us in Tel Aviv tonight. Keir, we appreciate you. Thanks. Well, we are just learning about four new attacks on U.S. military bases in Syria since U.S. forces struck facilities used by militants in that country over the weekend. The U.S. says the Iran-backed militants are responsible for the uh, approximately 52 attacks on the U.S. military in Iraq and in Syria in the last month, less than that, really. And this, as we're learning more about five American soldiers killed in a training exercise in the Mediterranean Sea. I want to bring in Courtney Cuby now from her post at the Pentagon. So, Courtney, we're also seeing some extent, ex, uh, intense exchanges in Lebanon. Walk us through what we know about this now, these, these new strikes in Syria, and how this all connects to the concern about an escalation and a spreading of the war in Gaza. Well, we're, we're seeing things like those, those attacks in Lebanon, like these continuing attacks against bases with uh, housing Americans in Iraq and Syria. That all goes to the continuing concern among U.S. officials, especially here in the Pentagon, that what we're seeing in Israel and in Gaza, this war, could spread to a larger regional conflict. And that's really why the U.S. military has taken now three series of strikes in Syria. The goal is to stop these attacks against bases with Americans and prevent a larger conflict. While the, the strikes are directly aimed at these Iranian militia backed militia groups who are carrying out the attacks, the message is very clearly being sent to Iran to tell these groups to stop. Iran, of course, may not be directly directing every one of these attacks, but they train, they equip, they fund many of these groups. And not and these, we hadn't seen attacks like this against U.S. forces since March. There really had been an absence of them for months now. They started ticking up again on October 17th. And since then, there's been a really steady drumbeat. But as you mentioned, Aaron, there have now been four attacks against U.S. bases in Syria since the U.S. took these airstrikes last night. So we're still waiting to see. But so far, it doesn't seem that that deterrent effect has has kicked in immediately. Courtney, I also want to ask you about these uh, young soldiers in their 20s and 30s who were killed in this accident in the Mediterranean. Uh, what more do we know about them tonight? Yeah, we, we learned, you know, the, the military and the Pentagon were very quiet about the specifics of this of this helicopter crash in the eastern Mediterranean on Friday night because of the unit that's involved. They're the 160th SOAR. It's a special operations aviation regiment, and it's a pretty small community, Aaron, and, and that's why the U.S. didn't want to put out any specifics. These They're called the Night Stalkers. They're a very elite group of U.S. soldiers who, are, who do things like what they were training for on Friday night. 
air, aerial refueling with a helicopter. It's called an MH-60. It's similar to what we might think of as a Black Hawk, but it has some very special modifications. Uh, during this re refueling mission, it was very late at night. It was in the dark. There was some sort of a mishap in the air. The helicopter crashed. All five on board were lost. Um, these are, again, special operations units just doing a training mission, but it's really important to point out the Pentagon has sent a number of, of these very elite special operators forward to Cyprus and to the region to be there in case there is a need for a large-scale evacuation or a hostage rescue. They're there on standby just in case they're needed for that, Aaron. And I know that they were all, uh, they had families that were a part of the, the, the Army over, over generations as well. And so our thoughts are with their families tonight. Courtney Q before us at the Pentagon. Courtney, thank you. Well, tens of thousands of people expected to march on Washington tomorrow. This time, a show of solidarity with Israel five weeks after the deadly attack by Hamas. This march is being organized by Jewish Federations of North America. In addition to showing support for Israel, this group is marching to condemn the rising trend of anti-Semitic violence and to demand that every hostage be released. This march comes as a Biden administration official tells NBC News there is a possible deal for a hostage exchange. It would involve the release of about 80 women and children held by Hamas in exchange for Palestinian women and teens held by Israel. Nine American citizens are still missing after the October 7th attack by Hamas. The Supreme Court today announcing it is formally adopting a code of conduct after allegations of ethics lapses raised questions about whether justices were following the rules. The court saying most of the rules and principles they outlined today are not new, but that the lack of a formal code has recently led to, quote, the misunderstanding that the justices of this court, unlike other jurists in this country, regard themselves as unrestricted by any ethics rules. Lawrence Hurley covers the Supreme Court for us and joins us now to help us understand what's happening here. So, Lawrence, we mentioned that the court says these are not new rules that they're following, but this is still something that we all sort of have to wrap our heads around. What, what stands out to you? What is new there? And, and, and have any of the rules been broken? Yeah, I mean, in the past, the justices didn't have their own sort of code of conduct, which is something that lower court judges have to follow. And they said that they kind of followed those same rules, but they couldn't follow them exactly the same as how lower courts follow them, partly because of the differences between the Supreme Court, where you know, there's only nine justices, and if one of them steps down from a case, it can create problems, and they can't be replaced. So things like that, like... They've said today for the first time, okay, this is how we're going to deal with that. These are the rules that we're going to follow. The question of whether they've violated these rules uh, is a very uh, subjective one. But like all these things about the judiciary, where it's about appearance of propri impropriety or integrity of the court and these types of things. And, you know, it remains to be seen, you know, how whether people are going to continue to complain that they haven't followed these rules. So what about the oversight piece of this, right? I mean, what? how uh, will this code be enforced on a court of, of justices who sort of, like we said, have their own rules and are lifetime appointees, so nobody's going to replace them if, if a rule is broken, per se? Yeah, I mean, basically, on, the, on this issue, they are the judges of their own conduct. Mm -hmm. uh, there is no enforcement mechanism, and that's one of the criticisms that has immediately come out as a result of this announcement, with uh, Democrats on the Senate Judiciary Committee, including Sheldon Whitehouse, saying, you know, that there needs to be an enforcement mechanism because we can't trust, as he would put it, the justices to be the, their own judges. And so um, we, it remains to be seen, you know, uh, whether this quells any of the, the criticism of the court, but so far, based on the reactions today, it's not going to. Yeah, we know you'll be keeping an eye on it to see what happens next in this, since it hasn't really quieted some of the complaints. Lawrence Hurley, we appreciate it. Thank you. No worries. Thanks. Right now, House Republicans taking a big step to move forward with the House Speaker's last-minute plan to keep the government open. There is a Friday night deadline that could lead to a near-total shutdown if it's missed. Now, if the Rules Committee gives the okay, all eyes turn to tomorrow for a floor vote that, if passed, will send the bill to the Senate. The plan from Speaker Mike Johnson would take a so-called two-step approach that would extend funding for areas like agriculture, transportation, veterans affairs until mid-January. The rest of the bills, including defense spending, would get a longer extension through the beginning of February. Now, this whole plan not 
hugely different than what former Speaker Kevin McCarthy used to keep the government open back in late September. That, of course, led to McCarthy's ouster at the hands of his own members, and it kicked off weeks of speakerless chaos on the Hill. NBC's Ryan Nobles is following this for us tonight. So, Ryan, uh, Speaker Johnson can, can really only, only afford to lose the support of three of his members before he has to call in some Democrats for help here. If that happens, is there a motion to vacate round two sort of in the cards here? Aaron, no one is saying that quite yet, but it remains this cloud that hangs over the speakership, whomever happens to be sitting in that chair. So it is certainly something that Mike Johnson has to be mindful of. But there does appear to be some sort of a honeymoon period right now that he has uh, afforded himself that now that he's new in the job. And he does feel as though he can muscle through this two-tiered continuing resolution with uh, losing a few Dem uh, Republicans and gaining a few Democrats and not have to pay the consequences long term. It seems as though Republicans are willing to afford him that opportunity to then get to the negotiating to table for a long term budget plan of which they are going to forcefully push for these budget cuts uh, and items along those uh, lines, including policy changes that could have to do with the southern border. So right now it's not an issue, but make no mistake, Aaron, it is always in the background of this conversation. And so, Ryan, since we spoke last hour, I understand that the Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer says that he's sort of pausing uh, a competing bill that was going to come out of the Senate. Uh, help us understand what that might mean. What does that say about the desire in both chambers and in both parties to avoid a government shutdown? What it likely means is that Senator Schumer is satisfied with the legislation that could emerge from the House. So what he had in place was a kind of a, a break glass in case of emergency plan for the Senate to pass their own version of a short term spending plan if the House was unable to come up with a package of their own. The fact that he's put a pause on this, especially given the timeline when we only have four days left before the government shuts down, indicates that if the House is able to pass their measure, then the Senate will likely adopt it as well. That's it's not that big of a surprise, given the fact that this is what we call a clean continuing, continuing resolution in that it has no budget cuts or any other substantive changes to the budget proposal. It essentially just extends it for a period of time to allow for negotiation. So it means that Senator Schumer is hopeful. The question is, will his hopes be confirmed by the House doing their part and getting this legislation passed sometime tomorrow? Aaron. All right. We know you'll be watching Ryan Nobles for us tonight on the Hill. Ryan, thanks. Well, questions tonight about the moment a Secret Service agent assigned to protect the president's granddaughter fired their gun last night. Officials say the agent saw possibly three people breaking the window of a parked government car, and that's when one of the agents fired their gun. Nobody was hurt. Now, this situation happened in the Georgetown neighborhood here in D.C., near the home of Naomi Biden-Neal. This comes as we are seeing carjackings on the rise in D.C. in the last few years. Police have reported more than 850, 860 some odd cases just this year alone. Ali Rafa joins us now. She's been tracking this story through the day. Ali, officials have kept a, a pretty, uh, pretty, pretty quiet about any additional information, as I understand it. Tell us what we do know about what happened. Yeah, Aaron. Well, what we do know comes from uh, Secret Service officials who are saying that just a little bit before midnight last night in, as you mentioned, the Georgetown area of Washington, D.C., uh, federal agents assigned to protect uh, one of President Biden's four granddaughters, Naomi Biden, uh, noticed uh, what they say are th were three individuals breaking the window of an unmarked, uh, an unoccupied parked government vehicle uh, outside of her apartment building in Georgetown. Uh, they say that an agent discharged their weapon. They don't believe anyone was struck by that when that happened. And those three people that they believe were breaking that window immediately fleed the scene. They said that immediately after that, they issued a bolo or a be on the lookout order for their uh, red vehicle that they said they took off in. Uh, and that order was issued to supporting units. And a source familiar says that there was no threat to the protectee at the time. There was no indication that this was a targeted attack because of Naomi Biden's relationship to the president. And they say they don't even believe that Naomi Biden was aware of what was going on outside of her home when that happened. Uh, and at this point, we know that the D.C. Police Department, as well as Secret Service, are working together to investigate this as those three individuals are still at large, Aaron. 
So, Ali, you and I were talking earlier today about how this isn't necessarily an isolated incident. When we talk about the rise in carjackings and car thefts that we're seeing here in the city, we know that there was an incident last month where uh, a congressman was carjacked by three armed people uh, fairly close, about a mile away from the Capitol or less. This seems to be something that we're seeing more and more of here in D.C., right? Absolutely. You mentioned what happened to Representative Henry Cuellar, uh, that carjacking just a few blocks from the Capitol. We've also seen uh, Congressman Angie Craig of Minnesota, who was assaulted inside of her D.C. Uh, apartment building. And the uptick of violent crime and carjackings has happened so rapidly here in Washington, D.C., that there's been a task force created to be able to address this. As a matter of fact, D.C. Uh, police are, are reporting more than 800 carjackings and more than 6,000 reports of stolen vehicles just over the last year. And this has gotten the attention of the White House. Uh, press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre was asked today during today's uh, White House preps, press briefing whether the president is concerned about this uh, surge in violence here considering Washington, D.C., of course, is home to so many lawmakers. Listen to what she said. We can't do this alone. The president, again, has taken action. He's, with the American Rescue Plan, billions of dollars were able to go into states, into communities, so that they can they can provide um, funding and police and police officers to make sure that their communities are safe. But we need more. The press secretary, call, the press secretary, rather, calling on Republicans in Congress to do more to improve public safety federally. Aaron. Ali Rafa for us outside the White House tonight. Ali, thank you. Well, Donald Trump Jr. back on the stand today as the defense starts its arguments in the $250 million civil fraud trial against his father and the family business. The former president's son testifying about the, quote, incredible things the Trump organization has accomplished over the years. And he praised his father as a visionary for pushing boundaries. This is the second time on the stand for the younger Trump, who was already called by prosecutors. Vaughn Hillier joins us now. Vaughn, uh, this is Don Jr.'s second time testifying, as we said. What did we hear from his testimony today for the defense versus what we heard when he was questioned by prosecutors? Right, Aaron. This is the key part here, is that it was his own defense lawyer asking him the question here. This is the second half of this trial that began today. Don Jr. was the first witness called to the stand by the defense lawyers. And unlike when the prosecution was asking Don Jr. questions, and the judge, Engoron, would judge jump in and uh, uh, like he did with uh, former President Trump last Monday, urging the defendants to answer the specific questions of the New York Attorney General prosecutor. This go around, uh, the defendant, Don Jr., was allowed to further elaborate and build out his own narrative over the course of more than four hours on the witness stand, specifically around the Trump organization and its history. Don Jr., dating back to the creation of the company by Fred Trump, down to his father, uh, long to the point where he became an executive with the company in the early 2000s. He laid out the different Trump properties, from the likes of Chicago to Hawaii to Las Vegas to Scotland to here in New York, and making the case as to why the Trump organization is of even greater value than uh, the financial records that he signed his name to, and that the judge in this case has already ruled uh, amounted to financial fraud, uh, is greater than. Uh, this is is a complicated case that Don Jr. is uh, trying to move past here as he elaborates as to the extent to which, in fact, the Trump organization uh, is not given its due credit for the extent to which it actually is valued. Yeah, I, would, I do want to ask you, Vaughn, uh, fr from what you've been seeing, what you've been reporting, how does the younger Trump here fit into the larger strategy of what the defense is trying to accomplish? Right. It's important to remember that this is not just the Trump organization that is a defendant here. Don Jr. and Eric, not Ivanka, but Don Jr. and Eric are defendants, as well as the former chief financial uh, officer, uh, Alan Weisselberg, uh, as well as Jeffrey McConney, the, the comptroller for the company. And Don Jr. has uh, repeatedly suggested that he relied on the word of the accountants of the company, those who were in charge of the actual finances. Well, that would responsibility would fall in 
the likes of Alan Weisselberg and Jeffrey McConney, two of the other defendants here. And this is where this case gets uh, tricky. Don Jr. did, in fact, sign these financial records. At the same time, he said that he relied on the words and the minutia to be understood and put together by the finance team here. And so this is where the judge has already ruled on the financial fraud uh, claims and one claim, but there are six other claims that he is now mulling over on how to rule. And Don Jr. is hoping that uh, he, the penalties incurred by him and his family uh, are not any uh, uh, additional to what he's already been ruled against on. All right, Von Hilliard for us tonight in New York City. Von, thank you. And coming up, a race against time in India. How officials there are trying to rescue 40 workers trapped in a collapsed tunnel. Plus, Aaron Rodgers hinting at what his future in the NFL looks like after his injury during the first game of the season. What he's telling NBC in our five things. Calls getting louder tonight for the Justice Department to investigate the death of a Mississippi man run over by a local police car. His family saying they were kept in the dark for months about his whereabouts while they thought he was only missing. Dexter Wade's family says a federal investigation is needed now more than ever after his body was exhumed from a pauper's field this morning at the family's request, but hours before they were told it would happen, meaning no one but the public works crews were there to witness it. Dexter's mother voicing her frustration earlier today. Listen. Now y'all have buried my baby. Y'all have took him out the ground. Y'all put him in the ground without my permission. So I don't have no permission. Now, we've been covering this story on this program since NBC News reporter John Shupe broke it last month. Dexter Wade was last seen alive by his mother in March as he walked out of the home they shared. He was killed just minutes after that as he tried to cross a busy freeway uh, on foot. Dexter's mother would spend the next 172 days totally in the dark until police realized they had made what they say was a clerical error in not informing the family. NBC's Blaine Alexander is covering this story for us tonight. And Blaine, after so many months, the Wade family finally got Dexter's body back, but only this is raising uh, suspicions toward Jackson officials, right? Yeah, his body was exhumed earlier today, Aaron, but that's only after essentially what can best be chalked up to as some sort of miscommunication, and that's at best. That's what officials are telling our John Shupi, who's there in the ground and really just kind of working the story. But bottom line, what happened is that the time for the exemption was set for 11.30 a.m. That's according to representatives for the family. Everybody had planned for that. However, they say that when they got there, it had already happened. They actually weren't even able to be present that some public works uh, county workers had shown up and exhumed his body earlier and so they weren't able to actually witness it happening so that pain that frustration that you heard from Dexter's mother that was certainly in response to that as well as everything else that's happened over the past few months or so so that's what happened earlier today uh, we know that attorney Ben Crump has been speaking out he's representing the family he spoke very strongly basically saying this is yet another reason why they are unable to trust the Jackson Police Department here's a little bit of what he told reporters today take a look Imagine if this was your loved one, who they killed and then buried without your permission and then exhumed them after they told you they were going to respect you this time. Would you trust anybody in Mississippi now? So when I spoke with Dexter's mother uh, a few days ago, she told me that her overall goal here was to exhume his body, one, because she wanted to get a private autopsy. She wanted to have a better idea of what was going on, what had happened surrounding his death. But also she said that she wanted to give him a proper burial and a proper funeral, Aaron. Which he certainly deserves. Uh, Dexter's family and their lawyers want to see the, the DOJ step in here, right? Uh, as you said, you just talked to his mom. Yeah. Uh, what, does, what does justice for Dexter Wade look like to this family? Well, the biggest thing is they want to know exactly what happened. As you heard, they have no trust in the Jackson Police Department. They have no trust in Mississippi officials. That was already established. What happened today has only deepened that. So they really want the DOJ to come in. We understand that already a formal request has been made for the Civil Rights Division to come in and really just take a look at this from the very beginning to end and get answers as to what happened. That's what she's looking for. She also, again, wants to have a proper place to go and basically pay her respects to him, a headstone to go and speak to her son. 
But finally, anybody who is found to be, uh, who has done wrong in this, she wants them to be held accountable. And that's certainly something that she and her attorney are pressing for, Aaron. Blaine Alexander, live for us in Atlanta tonight. Blaine, thank you. Let's get you over to the five things we think you should know about tonight. Number one, a state of emergency in Iceland with officials there saying there's a really good chance of a volcanic eruption soon. Hundreds of earthquakes have been shaking the island for weeks now. There's a coastal town that's been evacuated. That's after cracks formed on roads there. Scientists say there is a large magma tunnel forming underground. Number two, police arrested two people in connection with a fire at an Atlanta apartment complex. Officials think the man and woman here may have set off fireworks. Our Atlanta affiliate says hundreds of people are displaced now. No major injuries were reported. Number three, Senator Tim Scott dropping out of the 2024 Republican presidential race. He made the announcement on Fox News, surprising several of his own campaign staffers. Scott says he thinks voters, quote, have been really clear that they're telling me not now. Number four, New York Jets quarterback Aaron Rodgers saying his goal is to come back to the NFL by next month. Now you'll remember Rodgers tore his Achilles at the start of the season and has been out ever since. The star player telling NBC's Melissa Stark that he knows it sounds insane, but a good surgery paired with a quote, good patient makes this possible. Number five, a new study finding that keeping some secrets can actually be good for you. Keep it to yourself. Researchers say that if you wait before telling people good news, it can make you feel more energized and more alive. And even if you decide to never share that secret, you will still see positive benefits to your mental state. Well, when we come back, hundreds of thousands of people bracing for a traffic crisis after a huge fire shut down one of the country's busiest interstates. Why officials say it could be closed indefinitely. That's next. Plus, what happened in Rome after a lion escaped from a circus? That's later in The Global. A surprising return to politics in the UK, the familiar face being named foreign secretary. That's coming up in the global. First, though, one of the country's busiest and most important interstates could become a traffic nightmare. Transportation officials saying this is an all hands on deck situation. This highway you see right here, the I-10, that goes right through the heart of Los Angeles, usually seeing about 300,000 cars and trucks every day. Look at this. Totally empty today. A massive fire ripped through storage lots underneath the highway. Now it's closed in both directions for the foreseeable future. This comes as TSA today saying it is expecting to get more than uh, more travelers than ever at airport security this holiday season. That travel surge is getting started this weekend ahead of Thanksgiving. And from this Friday up to November 28th, TSA anticipating screening some 30 million passengers. Liz Kreutz is joining us now from Los Angeles. And Liz, we heard from transportation officials there in L.A. today. Uh, what are they saying about a, a timeline to get things back up and running with this, this freeway? Hey, Aaron. Well, as we speak right now, a press conference is underway with Governor Gavin Newsom addressing this and still no timeline on when this is going to get reopened. Right now, it's closed indefinitely as this investigation continues because of the concerns about the structural safety of this portion of the freeway. What Governor Newsom just said is that samples had been taken from some of the concrete and rebar at the highway. Some of the sample results have come back. He says that those are promising. They're waiting to get more results uh, by tomorrow. Tomorrow, and that's going to help them determine whether or not they need to actually demolish the entire portion of the highway and rebuild it or just repair it. And if they have to demolish it, that is what could take a long time. This is no easy task. Here's what Mayor Bass, the mayor of L.A., said earlier today. This was a huge fire, and the damage will not be fixed in an instant. Losing the stretch of the 10 freeway will take time and money from people's lives and businesses. It's disrupting in every way. And both CAL FIRE and the California Highway Patrol state agencies are helping with this investigation. A CAL FIRE spokesperson told me that as part of their investigation into how the fire started, they have not ruled out arson. So that's part of the investigation, Aaron. You know, obviously this is happening ahead of uh, a big travel time, right? A lot of people are going to be flying. We know that. But there's still another 49 million people expected to be driving over the holidays. This I-10 
it's closed for more than a mile. Um, the, the section we've got on the screen here, look at that. You can see where it's closed. But there could be ripple effects, right, into other key freeways in that area. How critical is it to get this road back open? Yeah, it's really critical, Aaron. You mentioned it earlier, 300,000 people travel on this freeway usually every single day, so it impacts a lot of people. For perspective, I-95 in Philadelphia, that portion that collapsed earlier this year, uh, that's about half the number of people that travel on that portion of the freeway every day. So this has a huge impact here in L.A. It does have a ripple effect into other freeways around the area, and as you mentioned, the timing's not great. We also have rain on the way in the next couple of days, and then beyond that, it's the Thanksgiving travel already travel in L.A. is a mess during the holidays. And so this is only going to add insult to injury if it stays closed through next week, Aaron. All right, Liz Kreutz for us live in Los Angeles. Liz, thank you. All eyes are on the meeting between President Biden and China's President Xi Jinping set for this Wednesday. The two have no shortage of hard issues to talk through as the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Summit is underway in San Francisco this week. The leaders of the world's two biggest economies are sitting down for the first time in a year. Some of the focus heading into this meeting squarely on the host city itself. San Francisco, still struggling to rebound from the pandemic, is now inviting in leaders from all around the world. So how will they view the city? Jake Ward has that story. San Francisco is already a target of America's conservative media. San Francisco has hit rock bottom and they need an intervention. Now, the arrival of the 21 APEC nations in the backdrop of the high-stakes meeting between two of the world's most powerful men means it is under the spotlight globally. It'll get scrutiny from countries like China, which already judges the place pretty harshly. A city where millions of immigrants once came to chase the American dream is now a place where many are trying to flee from. Chinese tourists have mocked the city's rough reputation on social media, and diplomats used past episodes like 2020's Black Lives Matter protests to depict democracy as a failed experiment. Racial discrimination against minorities is chronic sickness in American society. After the pandemic and remote work emptied San Francisco's downtown, local businesses are eager for this week of Asian Pacific power players. APEC is going to be wonderful for the city. Gil Payumo is ready. It comes in a perfect moment. We need this, you know, drastically. But is the city? San Francisco has been repaving streets and power washing train stations to prepare for 30,000 visitors from 21 nations. The delegates, the press, the CEOs, right. it's going to be pretty, right. pretty amazing. San Francisco's mayor says it's a chance to turn the city's image around. We expect lasting impacts on our city, uh, whether it's the economy, tourism, conventions, and also just really uh, the narrative about San Francisco. Are there any steps that you've tried to take as mayor ahead of APEC to keep a diplomatic core member from, you know, wandering into the wrong part of the city? We are not trying to hide what the problems are of San Francisco. And we hope that people get a chance to experience, of course, great parts of San Francisco, but also know that we have our challenges and they are not as bad as what people are trying to portray them as. It is a beautiful city full of picturesque scenes, but a visitor doesn't have to walk far to encounter some misfortune. The summit cordoned off several blocks of downtown, and people living on the streets in that area have been moved by city crews in recent days. The city will be patrolled by state, federal, and city officers all week. But how San Francisco is portrayed abroad is not up to the mayor. People have their own plans, their own agendas for whatever they decide they want to use San Francisco for. And what I like to do is make sure that people have at least the opportunity to experience it for themselves. With so many visitors in town and world leaders dueling over trade and diplomacy, APEC summit here could fuel spin about the condition of the West, sure. But for at least some of the delegates, they'll go home with memories of a meal, a sunset, a view from the hilltops. And Jake Ward joins us live now from San Francisco. So, Jake, the mayor said that, that they're not trying to hide the reality of the city, right? But talk a little bit about how concerned the city is in hosting an event like this potentially based on some of the negative media attention that, that the city's gotten. 
Well, I think people here in the United States, Aaron, have already brought, of course, their perception of San Francisco to uh, media portrayals, uh, you know, up and down the dial. But, uh, you know, Asian nations, uh, you know, some of the most prosperous, most urban countries in the world gathering here, they're going to be bringing an entirely different set of standards. I mean, China alone, right, is a place that does not exa exactly uh, tolerate disorder. And here you're going to have the prospect of, of not just some of the urban challenges we've seen, the break-ins, the smell of marijuana in the air. Um, you're going to have protests out in the open. All of that, of course, is of a concern. But as you heard the mayor say there, she says, we are not trying to hide anything here. We are instead just hoping that people get to experience the city for themselves, Aaron. And you talked about some of the some of the good things, some of the stuff that we can appreciate about the San Francisco Bay Area. And we heard Gil talk there about potentially, you know, the money that will be spent there. So sort of a net positive for the local economy? I mean, it absolutely is in terms of this week and beyond. But the real hope here, Aaron, is the more than 1,000 CEOs who are also gathering for APEC. You've got the CEO of Citigroup and Exxon and hundreds more gathered in this town. This is a city, of course, that made its name and its money off of being the headquarters of so many brand name companies. I have no doubt that it is the hope of the mayor. She said it over and over again uh, that we're hoping that, that the CEOs will see that this is the place to be, uh, you know, from all the places they could choose from around the world, Aaron. All right, Jake Ward for us in San Francisco tonight. Jake, thanks. Well, NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day. And because it's tough to read, watch, or listen to them all, we have you covered. We call this segment The Global. From India, rescuers are working to reach something like 40 workers trapped in a collapsed tunnel. This thing was under construction. Excavators have been digging through the dirt and the debris there to get to these workers. Police say everybody stuck is safe, and they've been able to get them food and water. From the UK, former Prime Minister David Cameron making a surprise return to government today. The current Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, appointing him as the new Foreign Secretary in a big cabinet reshuffle. Cameron led the UK from 2010 to 2016, and he oversaw the Brexit vote, which ultimately led to his resignation. And in Italy, authorities have captured a lion that escaped a circus near Rome over the weekend after it was on the loose for hours. Look at this guy, just trotting through town. You can see it roaming through the streets here. The mayor there warning people to stay home while they searched for the big cat. Authorities caught it, sedated it, and returned it to the circus. Fingers crossed. Nobody got hurt, though, while he was out. Coming up, landmark new guidelines from the FCC could help millions of domestic abuse survivors. That's next in tonight's original. Well, now we want to bring you tonight's original with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been keeping an eye on. Tonight, we're looking at a critical decision from the Federal Communications Commission set to come down on Wednesday. It would impact millions of American victims and survivors of domestic violence. This is something so common, the National Domestic Violence Hotline says it affects more than 12 million people every year. The new guidelines up for vote would force phone companies to be more responsive and more sensitive to cases of domestic violence because a cell phone could be a lifeline for someone in a violent and dangerous situation. Noah Pransky brings us the story. You know a cell phone as your daily planner or your gaming device or a social outlet. But does someone in an abusive relationship it's a lifeline. He got so mad and he started choking me and my son woke up and he was crying and that did not stop him from keep, come, keep going. Joanne, a domestic violence survivor, remembers that one night particularly well. I eventually uh, managed to, you know, run out the house without shoes and uh, I run to the neighbor to ask for a phone so I can call the cops because he had took all the phones from me. Joanne has a complicated relationship with phones. She said it was a way for her ex to monitor her. It was a tool of control for years. A lot of people are depending financially from their abusers. Until she finally separated from her family plan and got her own phone. If you've ever tried to change your cell phone number or your cell phone plan, you know how incredibly challenging it can be even without an abusive relationship. But adding domestic violence and it gets exponentially harder. That though is about to change. The Federal Communications Morning. Commission is set to vote Wednesday on landmark new guidelines that will force cell phone providers to be more responsive to victims of domestic violence. 
part of the Safe Connections Act, the new rules will mask calls to domestic violence hotlines and shelters from cell phone bills, make it easier for victims to separate from their family plans, and provide new low-cost phones for men and women who need to escape a dangerous situation. If you are living through really unthinkable circumstances and suffering quietly with domestic abuse, it is hard to pick up that phone and call someone. And it's doubly hard if you know that there's going to be a record of it that your abuser will see. Jessica Rosenworcel, the first woman to ever lead the FCC, has been shaping the new regulations with input from advocates, including those of the National Domestic Violence Hotline. Are you safe to talk right now? Which makes 90,000 contacts each month, more than a million each year. And most of those victims reach out via cell phone. You know, I think about when I worked in a local shelter and a woman coming in with her kids. I'm gonna start crying. Make to be real. A woman coming in to the shelter with her children and the cell phone being the vehicle that she would use to look for a job, to call the local clinic, to be able to communicate with her kids' school. We have to be able to have the ability for her to do that safely and privately to protect not only her life, but her children's life. According to the hotline, one in four women and one in seven men will experience physical violence in their lifetime. Rosenworcel wants to try to improve those numbers. When I took over the Federal Communications Commission, this is not the things that I thought I would do, be doing with my day to day, but it's been among the most gratifying work we're doing. And Joanne, now years removed from her bad situation, is glad other victims will have one more tool to build their exit plans. Being able to get your own plan kind of make you feel somehow, I know it might sound weird, but self-sufficient as a person. Noah Pransky is joining us now. Uh, Noah, talk to us about the relationship really between a, a domestic violence victim and a cell phone and, and what this FCC vote could actually do for these some of these victims. Yeah, it seems like a small measure, but it really is a huge deal. A few numbers for perspective here. We have a lot of neighbors who are going through this and we may never know it. According to the National Domestic Abuse Hotline, um, 24 people per minute in America are victims of rape, violence, or stalking. And another number here, Aaron, 98% of abuse rela abusive relationships, according to the hotline, include financial abuse or control as well. And that's why cell phone independence is so important. One other set of really important numbers here, the National Domestic Violence Hotline. If you want to reach them, you can, t you can call 1-800-799-7233 or text the word START to 88788. Reaching out for help, Aaron, is the first step toward finding a way out of a bad situation. All right, Noah Pransky for us tonight. Some really important information there. Noah, thank you. Yeah. Still to come, a new way to treat high cholesterol could involve editing your genes. We're breaking down a new study with a doctor. Stay with us. Well, for the first time, new research is showing that gene editing, that's when doctors and scientists use technology to change your DNA, can actually help cut down on high cholesterol. Now, this could impact millions of people in the U.S. who have this genetic condition that causes really high cholesterol. The scientists behind this study say it could eventually be a powerful new way to prevent heart attacks and even strokes. Dr. Kavita Patel is joining us now to help us understand how it all works. So without getting too technical here, <laughs> help us understand how does this work and, and, and uh, uh, yeah, how could it be a game changer? Yeah, science is amazing. If you had told me in medical school that we would have something that surgically cuts genes down to the letter, if you remember how the genes look with that double helix mm -hmm. and the kind of A's and the D's and the E's, it can literally clip out one of those letters. And that's what we're talking about, a technology called CRISPR. And that that is what scientists looked at to try to tackle a gene that can result in high cholesterol. And so they say, yes, we think we can we can do something about right. this, but it was a pretty small was sample small. size here, right? So how, did, right. how are they able to draw these sort of conclusions? Yeah, so what they were looking for is kind of proof of concept. Mm -hmm. That's really what having a 10 patient panel size does for you in a study like this. It's just, is this technically feasible? Does it actually result in clinical outcomes? And then can we track over longer term and short term any effects or things that are bad, safety issues that we would want to flag? So that's why it's 10, but the plans are to expand. And again, 
it can impact just in the United States alone, millions of people who have this one particular expression of a gene, PCSK9, which actually helps clean out your body of bad cholesterol. So we're actually turning off a gene that helps produce bad cholesterol. You know, I think about the fact that as we're talking, I realize I, I didn't take my allergy pill today. I didn't take I, my vitamin. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Right. I'm but, the same. But the, you know, I think about in this case, there are statins that people take to try to control cholesterol. But we know that people don't always you remember know? to take the stuff that they're supposed to, to take. This would sort of eliminate human error when it comes to cholesterol. We yeah. hope so. We still have a lot of those long term questions. And then this was just 10 patients. Will we see this in other populations that have this gene expression? But it is again. Game changer, not just for high cholesterol, but all the other diseases we're applying it to, Alzheimer's, cancer. The FDA is going to be reviewing this type of technology, CRISPR, for sickle cell. It will change the lives, potentially, of billions when you think about this technology and then applying it to what you just said. And if it makes you feel better, we're all human. <laughs> I forget to take my medications. I did this morning. Yeah. So I'll go home and do that. All right, we'll both catch up. <laughs> yeah. I, I do have to wonder, though. I mean, we, we talk about the FDA. We look at how right. science happens. Right. It doesn't typically move quickly. No, it doesn't. So when you look at something like this, how far out do you think we are from yeah. being able to apply this in a more practical way across all these different uh, issues? That yeah, I, I do think that the next decade is going to be just a renaissance era in genetics, cell therapy, and those we've already gotten, like this study, we've already got the proof of concept. And then in other places, cell therapy and genetic therapies that can help with sickle cell, cystic fibrosis, we've got proof of concept and patient in trials. So we're in a really incredible position, Aaron. This is a little bit like a couple of decades ago when yeah. we started having more treatments for cancer. And today I can tell you an advanced, a patient with advanced lung cancer, I can bring them to survival in five years. I couldn't wow. say that a decade ago. Yeah. Same for this technology. It is amazing. As you say, science. science. Look at it. <laughs> Dr. Yeah. Kavita Patel, we appreciate you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks so much. And that is a wrap for this hour. More coverage picking up right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.